Our objectives today are to describe the anatomy of the GI tract wall, describe the physiologic changes seen with Hirschsprung's disease, peptic ulcer disease, and celiac sprue. Our group members that you will be hearing from today are Carly Hopkins, Amber Amy, Tara Becker, Shayla High, and Brittany Jordan. The GI tract wall from the esophagus through the large intestine is a tube composed of four concentric layers. From deep, which is the lining of the lumen, to superficial, which is the external covering, these layers are the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis, and the adventitia or the serosa. The mucosa is divided into three layers. One is a superficial epithelium lining the lumen of the GI tract. Two is an underlying areolar connective tissue called the lamina propria. The third is a relatively thin layer of smooth muscle called the muscularis mucosae. The lining epithelium of most abdominal GI tract organs is a simple columnar epithelium. The epithelium of the intestine is also further specialized in a way that maximizes the surface area available for nutrient absorption. Throughout the small intestine, it is folded up into finger-like projections called villi. Between the villi are infoldings known as crypts. Stem cells that give rise to both crypt and villus epithelial cells reside toward the base of the crypts and are responsible for completely renewing the epithelium every few days or so. The submucosa components include accumulations of lymphatic tissue in some of mucosal regions, mucin secreting glands that project ducts across the mucosa and open into the lumen of the tract in the esophagus and the duodenum, many large blood vessels and lymph vessels, and also nerves that extend fine branches into the mucosa and the muscularis. The nerve fibers and their ganglia are collectively referred to as the submucosal nerve plexus or Meisner plexus. The continuous presence of bacteria and other stimuli, as well as the large surface area that must be defended against potentially harmful substances, accounts for the fact that the intestine has very well developed local immune system that comprises both innate and adaptive immune effectors. The muscularis layer typically contains two layers of smooth muscle. The fibers of the inner layer of smooth muscle are oriented circumferentially around the GI tract and are called the inner circular layers. The fibers of the outer layer are oriented lengthwise along the GI tract and are called the outer longitudinal layer. At specific locations along the GI tract, the inner circular muscul muscle layer is greatly thickened to form a sphincter. A sphincter closes off the lumen opening at some point along the GI tract, which helps control the movement of materials through the GI tract. The nerve fibers and associated gl ganglia located between the two layers of smooth muscle are collectively referred to as the myenteric nerve plexus. The serosa or adventitia is the outermost layer. Above the diaphragm of the esophagus, the serosa is fibrous connective tissue. Below the diaphragm, the serosa is the mesentery or visceral peritoneum, which is a serous membrane. Lining the abdominal cavity is the parietal peritoneum, usually simply called the peritoneum. Many parts of the GI tract deviate from this generic structural pattern. The esophagus has these layers, but it deviates from the pattern in two ways. Its mucosa has stratified squamous epithelium, and its muscularis has a skeletal muscle in its superior region, skeletal muscle and smooth muscle in the middle region, and smooth muscle in the inferior region. The stomach has these similar layers, layers but it deviates from the pattern in that its muscularis has three layers of smooth muscle. The large intestine has these layers, but in its muscularis, the outer longitudinal layer of muscle forms three distinct bands called tenae coli. The rest of the colon is gathered to fit these bands. This gives the colon a puckered appearance. The puckers or pockets are called hostra, which provide for more surface area within the colon. Now that we know the normal anatomy of the GI tract wall, we will go on to discuss the pathologic changes affecting the anatomy of the GI tract that can result in disorders or diseases. Okay, so let's talk about Hirschsprung's disease. 
What is Hirschsprung's disease? It's a disease that causes lower gastrointestinal obstruction in neonates. It is a colonic obstruction that may result in fecal stagnation, bacterial overgrowth with toxin production, enterocolitis, overflow diarrhea, hypovolemic shock, and infant death. The condition is caused by congenital absence of some and or all the normal bowel parasympathetic ganglion cells. These cells begin at the anus and extend in variable lengths. So some symptoms of Hirschsprung's is uh, signs of extreme dilated colon with chronic constipation, fecal impaction, abdominal extension, overflow diarrhea, jaundice, poor feeding, poor weight gain, malnutrition, and failure to pass meconium shortly after birth. So diagnosis of Hirschsprung's disease would be a barium contrast enema is usually used for diagnosis, but for mild cases, when the BE results is negative, rectal biopsy is the diagnostic standard. It occurs in 1 in 5,000 children with a male to female ratio of 4 to 1. About 15% of cases are diagnosed in the first, first months of life, or 64% by the third month, and 80% by first year of age. Only 8% remain undiagnosed by three years of age. So some treatment options is a surgical excision of the affected segment and re-anastomosis of healthy bowel by many different procedures. Patients can use enemas, especially before surgery. Rectal washouts and irrigation of the colon can be done to try and prevent surgery colonoscotomy in most cases and laparoscotomy in less severe cases. Our prognosis is usually good. A few children will continue to have problems with constipation post-operatively. This usually results from residual unresected aganglionic bowel or an associated intestinal neuronal dysplasia Children who get treated early or who have a short segment of bowel involved usually have a better outcome. Next is peptic ulcer disease. The etiology of peptic ulcer disease includes H. pylori as the major cause. Smoking, alcohol, medications such as NSAIDs and glucocorticoids as well as decreased blood flow to gastric mucosa are included in the etiology. Symptoms of peptic ulcer disease include epigastric pain that can be described as gnawing, burning, boring, aching, and severe hunger pains. Duodenal ulcers can present with pain a few hours after eating and may feel some relief with some foods or antacids. Gastric ulcers are more variable than duodenal ulcers and can worsen when eating. Diagnosis can include a radiographic endoscopy or biopsy. H. pylori can also be detected through a stool antigen test or urethra, urea breath test. Treatment includes to stop smoking, avoid alcohol, NSAIDs, and food that trigger symptoms. If an H. pylori positive test, the patient can be treated with antibiotics such as a PPI plus metronidazole 250 milligrams four times a day and clarithromycin 500 milligrams um, two to three times a day. If an H. pylori negative test, patients can be treated with antacids alone for four to six weeks, such as H2 receptor antagonists or PPIs. For maintenance therapy of patients on long-term NSAIDs, they can be treated with misoprostol and PPIs. Now I'm gonna talk about celiac sprue. What is celiac sprue? It's a condition that damages the lining of the small intestines, leading to malabsorption of essential nutrients. It's an allergy to gliadin, a component of gluten present in wheat, barley, and rye. The etiology is unknown. It's most common in Caucasians of European descent. Environmental and immunologic factors play an important role. 
The symptoms of celiac sprue may appear with the introduction of cereals in an infant's diet. They may start to occur at any age, occur in frequent cycles of remission and exacerbations, and can include any of the following. Diarrhea or constipation, steatorrhea, unexplained weight loss, signs and symptoms of nutrient deficiency, abdominal pain, bloating, gas, indigestion, and nausea and vomiting. The, to diagnose celiac sprue, an endoscopy or serological studies can be performed. In an endoscopy, a presence of abnormal biopsy of the small intestine before and after elimination of gluten from the diet is required for diagnosis. Histologically, the biopsy will show a flat appearance caused by absence of reduced height of villi, cuboidal appearance and nuclei that are abnormally oriented in epithelial cells, and increased lymphocytes and plasma cells in the lamina propria. For serological studies, IgA and TTGs will be present. This is a picture showing the normal intestines and the celiac intestines. And as you can see, there's villus atrophy, crypt hyperplasia, which causes malabsorption of nutrients. For the treatment of celiac sprue, exclusion of gluten from the diet, 90% 90, 90 of patients will respond to this dietary restriction. Restriction of other dietary proteins such as soy, and patients may also respond to glucocorticoids. The prognosis, there's increased rich risk for development of the following types of cancer. Gastrointestinal, non-gastrointestinal, and intestinal lymphoma. With treatment, the overall prognosis of celiac sprue is good.